welcome back, everyone. It's fantastic to see standing room only for our final speaker. It's a real treat having him here. Who can say that they've built their own iPhone? Our next speaker can, and not only did he build his own iPhone, he went down the rabbit hole and figured out how to add the coveted headphone jack back to the iPhone 7. A compelling story he shared with us, with the world, on his YouTube channel, Strange Parts. His background is in software engineering, and he now describes himself, among other things, as a nomadic hacker. To guide us through the unlimited parts market of Shenzhen and the vast sourcing and repair expertise of the people found there, please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Scotty Allen. Thank you, Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, as, as Mike said, um, I've spent a bunch of time in Shenzhen, China on uh, some amazing adventures in the electronics markets and in the cell phone markets. I, I've spent uh, on and off about the past two years there. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the two projects that Mike mentioned, uh, building my own iPhone from parts that I bought in the markets, uh, and then adding a headphone jack to an iPhone 7. Um, and while I want to talk specifically about what I did, I also want to give you a flavor of what Shenzhen is like for hackers. Um, I really consider it the, the heart of the electronics manufacturing world right now. Um, tons of consumer electronics are assembled there. Um, it's very possible you have a device that was made there. Um, a lot of the iPhone and iPads uh, have been manufactured there, though that's starting to move around a little bit. Um, it's Shenzhen as a city is just across the border um, from Hong Kong. And it was the first place that the Chinese government experimented with the idea of capitalism and opening itself up to the rest of the world. And so they created this special economic zone in Shenzhen uh, to, to allow sort of trade, external trade, uh, and uh, allowing people to create businesses. And so what that's meant uh, is incredible growth. Uh, from 1980 to 2015, Shenzhen went from a sleepy fishing village of 30,000 people to a metropolis of 18 million. Uh, and so, uh, this is incredible, and it means the entire city is brand new, and nobody's from there. Everybody's there to seek their fortune. Uh, it's just got this incredible energy and this sort of relentless uh, force of progress. This is the part of the city um, where I typically stay. Um, this is Futian. Uh, it's kind of smack in the middle of the city. It's downtown. Uh, the area in red here is Huashang Bay, uh, which is the area that has the wholesale electronic markets. Uh, it's about 10 to 20 big buildings, um, and it's the largest wholesale electronics mar markets in the world. Um, so I was there uh, to, I originally came to explore the markets, explore the manufacturing scene, understand what that meant uh, specifically for myself as a hobbyist. Uh, and I was hanging out with lots of open source hardware hackers, uh, and we were hanging out one night at uh, street barbecue, drinking beer, and someone said, you know, I've been walking through all these cell phone parts markets, and I see all these screens and batteries and cell phone parts. I wonder if you could make your own phone from parts that you bought in the market. And so this set me off on this amazing adventure um, to see, could I, could I build my own phone? Uh, and so uh, some of you may have seen the video that I made about this adventure. Um, but for those that haven't, I want to give you just a quick overview of what that involves. Um, and it turns out you really only need four main parts to make a, uh, to make a cell phone. Um, <clears throat> first, you need a back, which is just the shell, the case. Um, these are some uh, uh, sort of typical looking uh, iPhone cases. Um, they're aluminum with um, sort of uh, isolation lines of plastic that isolate the antennas. Um, you can also get non-standard looking backs. So this is a lime green aluminum iPhone back. Um, red ones, this red one was out um, before Apple was making red ones. You can also get stuff that's very much Chinese aesthetics. Uh, gold is very popular. Um, it'll run you about 20 bucks um, to get a new looking one. Uh, batteries are really easy to find. Um, here we're testing to make sure that the battery is still holding a charge and is good uh, on a custom battery tester. Uh, they cost about $5, which should make you really angry if you've ever paid to replace your iPhone battery. <laughs> it makes me really angry. Um, screens, I actually went to a screen repair booth. Um, 
to uh, have them actually go through the process that they would go through to repair a screen to show uh, all of the lamination steps. Um, so here, we actually started with a working screen and tore it apart because I couldn't source a working LCD on short order. Uh, this is a custom built heater bed with a vacuum that holds the glass down. And then they just take a, like a piece of piano wire and slice uh, the optically clear adhesive that holds the glass on the front of the LCD. Um, this is one of my favorite tools. It's a soldering iron with a razor blade attached to the front. And they're slicing off the polarizer. Uh, here's putting on the new polarizer on the front of the LCD. And then he's peeling off the um, uh, plastic in that's on the already applied optically clear adhesive. And then he's going to uh, press it in a heat press here um, to press it down uh, and get it all aligned. There are custom jigs for each model of phone that you can buy in the markets. Uh, and then it's really important to remove all of the air bubbles um, with a vacuum. Uh, and it's very cleverly named. Uh, they put it under a vacuum with moderate heat um, for a few minutes. Uh, and then, so this is the front, the whole stack up in front of the LCD, done, no bubbles. Um, next, they flipped it over and um, replaced the uh, backlight. Uh, and we could have done all of these steps from scratch if I'd been able to source an LCD in time. They, they do exist, it was just a matter of getting one from a factory. Um, here we're soldering on, he's soldering on the um, backlight power supply. And then finally he's putting on a tester phone. The tester phones are a normal iPhone without the screen, instead they have a flex cable that wraps around to the front, and then they can plug in any random screen. And finally we're testing, he's testing for um, dead spots on the digitizer. So they do that by holding down one of the icons until they all wiggle, moving the icon around. If the icon drops, they've got a dead spot in the digitizer. Um, and he's just proving to me that it works uh, uh, to, to show that he's done a good job. Um, lastly, you need a logic board. Um, these are a few logic boards here. Uh, this is sort of like the, the logic or the motherboard um, for a PC. Uh, this is the most complex part uh, in the phone. Um, these ones have holes drilled in them. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about that right now, but uh, these are scrap in the markets. Um, you can pull parts off them. Um, these are the most complex part. It's also the most expensive part. Uh, it makes up the bulk of the cost of the phone. Uh, I thought that maybe I would be able to solder my own logic board, because you can actually buy bare boards uh, in the markets um, that have not been assembled yet. Uh, this was really my first foray into surface mount soldering, uh, and these are 01005s. Uh, <laughs> and I realized uh, after a couple of weeks that I might be over my head. Um, I still think it's possible, but I haven't gone down that rabbit hole much further. So instead, I went to one of the markets and I bought a refurbished logic board. Um, and here she's putting a sticker over one of the covers over some of the chips, um, just so that I don't, so that she can tell if I've tampered with it, because she gives me the standard market three-day warranty on parts, uh, which allows me to take this um, used repair logic board home, test it in my own setup, make sure that everything works properly, um, and if not, I can bring it back and she'll repair it or, or um, accept it for a refund. I actually had to do that. Uh, there was a, a um, the compass chip wasn't working properly. I brought it back, no questions asked, uh, no receipts, no contracts, it's just a handshake deal. Um, that's been my experience of how the markets work and, and people have been very legit with me. Um, Finally, here's a very um, fast version of assembling the phone. There's a, you can see there's a bunch more parts, but it's all like pretty much brackets and screws and a couple of flex connectors and cameras and stuff. Um, so it turns out like the hardest part of this whole thing was the fact that I don't speak Chinese very well. <laughs> and so it made it really hard to find these parts in the markets. And once I figured out how sort of everything was laid out in the markets and I, I figured out which booths to go to and what parts I needed and sort of how commerce in the markets worked, uh, to do it again would take me maybe a day or two. It would take me an afternoon to source the parts and you know, a few hours to put it together. And so, uh, and the question that everybody asks is, well, how much does it cost? It costs about 300 bucks to make a, a success at the time. It's about half of what it costs to buy it retail at the time, which makes sense. I mean, this is fundamentally, at the end of the day, a used phone. A lot of these parts, specifically the logic board, which is sort of the, you know, the brains of the phone and the most expensive part, that almost undoubtedly came out of a phone, might have been repaired. So the costs kind of all add up. This is not a great way to get a really cheap cell phone. Uh, if you just want a cheap iPhone, go buy a used one. Um, but it's a super interesting project to understand both how does this ecosystem work, um, but also like what's going on inside the phone and really get hands on. 
And so I started asking, okay, like, I've done this, I made this video, uh, a few people watched it and were really excited about it. Um, what can I do now with all this stuff that I've learned? Um, I have all this access to parts, and I have all of this access to manufacturing. And so I started thinking about, well, what can I do about modifying a phone? And while this was all going on, I, I had gone to the Apple store in Hong Kong, and I bought an iPhone 7, because I, I wanted a better camera, because I was shooting, a lot of the videos that I shot in the markets, I just shot on my cell phone. Um, and I, in the sort of the hectic, uh, uh, the hecticness of, of uh, releasing this video and buying the phone and everything, I had forgotten, legitimately forgotten that it didn't have a headphone jack. And I was kind of annoyed. And then I thought, I wonder if I could add my own. Uh, and I didn't really know, but I figured that Shenzhen was probably the best place in the world to try. So this is what I, I originally thought it was gonna look like. I thought, there's no way I'm gonna be able to add this headphone jack to the inside of the phone. So these are some of my initial sketches. Uh, I, I just thought I was gonna like make a new aluminum case. Like I thought, oh, I'm you know I'll model this case with all the like right screw bits and whatnot, and I'll take it to you know one of the CNC mill places, which are cheap and quick. They'll be able to mill me a new case with this like bump on the back to hold the the jack and then whatever other electronics I need. Uh, but I didn't really want to crack open the nice iPhone that I had just gotten from the Hong Kong Apple Store. Uh, so I went and got a used phone from the market uh, that had been refurbished. And I cracked it open and I was, I was like on camera recording as I'm cracking this thing open and I was fully prepared to say into the camera, see, there's no space in this phone. Like they put this part in the, in the space where the headphone jack would be. And then I cracked it open and I started poking and I started removing things and I realized that I couldn't actually say that. That what was in that corner was just like a piece of plastic and it, it just held down a connector and it didn't actually seem to be necessary. And so this is me on camera taking a 6S jack and going, I think with a little bit of shaving this down and moving a few things around, I think I could actually just fit this jack inside the phone. Uh, and so that like made this whole project a lot more ambitious. Because <laughs> now it was no longer can I add a jack, but can I add a jack inside the original case. So the first step was to, was to take a step back and say, okay, like how can I get this to work electrically? Uh, uh, you know, ignoring the mechanical piece. Um, I naively thought when I started that maybe I would just find like a vestigial audio connection from like the 6S audio traces that came down into that bottom flex connector from the logic board. The, no such luck. Like of course they had fully removed them. Uh, I did not find that. So I figured. I would go and get a bunch of the headphone adapters uh, that are the lightning to headphone adapter that you get with your phone. Um, and here's me in the, in the um, uh, Shenzhen Apple store asking for a bunch of those. Um, they were very uh, confused as to why I wanted to buy like three and five at a time. Um, <laughs> uh, and the plan was just to wire these up to the back of the lightning jack. Um, I should also point out there are a bunch of copies of these lightning adapters that are much cheaper that you can buy in the markets. I tried all of those. I tried every one I could get my hands on. They're all crappy. Um, they, they all don't work. Uh, and so I ended up having to get the real ones. Um, and so the, the, the plan was to like solder this to the back of the lightning jack uh, and then just sort of you know, act as though it had been plugged in. Um, but the problem with that was that lightning, it turns out, is, is really a point-to-point -point protocol and you can't have multiple things connected to the same lightning jack. And I still needed to be able to like charge the phone and you know, potentially occasionally plug it into iTunes and stuff. So, uh, so I tried, they have, there are various like splitters, lightning splitters, which are, are really for the, the problem of like being able to listen to music and charge your phone at the same time. Um, I tried them all in the markets. This was the only one that actually worked uh, consistently and well for all the features. And then the one from Belkin, which Apple sells in their stores. Um, but I bought these and cracked them open, and the boards inside were huge. There were just no way I was going to fit that into the phone. And there was tons of unlabeled chips, and I wasn't going to be able to reverse them. And I thought, OK, like, that's not a path to success here. So um, just to take a step back and talk a little bit about what I know about Lightning uh, that I've discovered in the process, uh, this is the diagram of the Lightning Jack um, from Wikipedia. Uh, it's actually not fully accurate. Um, but uh, there are a couple of things that are accurate on here and are worth pointing out. Uh, in my experiments, I have never seen anything happen with pins six through eight. 
Uh, I've never seen any signals on there. It's all one through five. Uh, one is ground, five is the um, charge voltage uh, when you're charging the phone. Uh, four is used for setup uh, when something is first plugged into the jack. Uh, and then two and three uh, actually run um, what looks like USB to me um, once the connection is established. Um, but the first thing I needed to do was just to be able to start like sniffing that signal with a logic analyzer or an oscilloscope. Um, and so I needed a way to just hook up to that electrically. And this is what I first started doing. This is the back, this is like the connector for the lightning jack, the back side of it. And um, I spent about 10 days learning how to do this. This is 30 odd Kynar, um, and I'm soldering uh, it onto the back of each pin. Um, this was excruciating. I ended up having to buy uh, you know, a reasonably decent uh, binocular microscope, uh, which was totally, it's one of the best tools I've ever purchased. It was like 300 bucks, including the camera in the markets. It's no brand name. But um, I'm in, I've worked out with the seller. Uh, she's on AliExpress now. So um, I'll be announcing how to get one of those if you're interested. Uh, microscopes are awesome. Uh, turns out <laughs> this was kind of a fool's errand because I later discovered on 1688, which is like the Chinese uh, side of Taobao, or of, of Ali, Alibaba, um, these, which are uh, PCB pass-through adapters for lightning. So it's a PCB plug. Uh, on the end there, and then there's a jack on the other side, and then the pads in the middle allow you to um, tap signals. Uh, you can just solder on some like JSG connectors uh, and get access to that. Um, and so I did that. I used these a ton in this project. They were great. They're like two bucks a piece and, and fantastic. Um, this is uh, a trace of what it looks like on pin four when you first connect. So. Uh, <clears throat> So the blue signal is uh, when it drops low, the phone detects that something's been plugged in and it starts sending SDQ, which is like a, a proprietary TI uh, one wire protocol. Uh, it starts streaming that out pin four. And it looks like to me, that's sort of how it initially figures out like what the heck was plugged in and how do I talk to it. Um, and then it switches over to USB on pins two and three. Um, however, how does it detect when something is first plugged in? It turns out that this is not an eight pin connector. It's actually a 10 pin connector. Uh, and the two rectangles on either side are uh, two little uh, prongs that touch the shield on the, the metal part of the lightning connector. Uh, and those, any, any plug for a, um, for a lightning cable shorts the, the, the shielding to ground on pin one. And so, uh, the phone, um, it looks like, sends out a little voltage uh, every, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, I think, on those pins. Uh, and when that's shorted to ground, then it sort of goes through its initialization sequence. Uh, that took me several weeks to figure out. I could not figure out why all of the hand wiring that I was doing w didn't seem to be doing anything. Like, nothing would connect. Uh, and you have, to, you have to deal with those shield uh, pins. Um, so. The question was like, how can I switch this, right? So I, the, the idea was uh, I want to connect the headphone adapter to the phone uh, when nothing is plugged into the jack. And then when something is plugged into the jack, I want to switch over and, and just have the phone talk to that. So um, a friend in Shenzhen recommended that I look at USB switch ICs. And it turns out these are awesome, they're super cheap, and they can totally switch lightning and USB. Um, so this is just a like four pole double throw switch. So there's normally connected four pins, normally open four pins, and then the common lines that they connect to, it's bi-directional. Um, the inline is what controls the switch. When it's low, it, it connects the normal, uh, normally closed, and when it's high, normally open. Um, it also has an enable disable line, which is super useful. Um, that will disconnect everything, um, and I'll explain why that's uh, super important. Um, again. The um, pins two and four, two through four, and shield are the only pins that matter. So I only needed a four-pole uh, switch. I didn't need to worry about uh, the, the charging pin or um, six through eight, which don't seem to be used at least for audio and um, and even like syncing to iTunes. So uh, <clears throat> the next problem was to figure out how can I detect when something is connected and disconnected. And I, I first started trying to look for those pulses that the phone was sending out, but they were so short and such low voltage, that seemed kind of uh, to be a, a hard task. So um, another friend suggested that I might just try pulling that shield up 
high with like a really high value resistor. I used a one mega ohm resistor, pulled it high to three volts. Um, and so then when something is, is plugged in and that's shorted to ground, that drops low. And so I just hooked that directly up to the, to the switch, to the in, input um, that switches the switch. And that worked great, but it wasn't reliable. Like one time out of five, one time out of 10, uh, you'd unplug the, the cable and it, it wouldn't, uh, the, the phone wouldn't realize that the, the headphone adapter was now plugged in. Uh, it just would, would say that there wasn't anything plugged in. And I think that's because the switch is actually uh, so fast that the phone never realized that anything had been disconnected. It just thought the previous thing was still connected. Um, so I added two one-shot timers, um, each for 100 milliseconds. Uh, one fires when uh, something is connected and one fires when something is disconnected. And those uh, drive that disable pin, that enable disable pin uh, through an OR gate. Um, and that totally fixed it. It's super reliable now. Um, so this is what the first prototype looked like. It's super ugly. I was having a really hard time soldering uh, the um, headphone adapter board down to my uh, circuit board. It's that blue thing in the upper corner and then there's one down here. Um, so it's super ugly, but uh, I sort of gradually evolved how I was doing that. Um, but <laughs> now the question was, okay, like this works electrically, but it totally doesn't fit in the phone. And so, uh, you know, the question is, what do I do there? Uh, and the answer was uh, a flexible circuit board, FPC. And I'd totally never done that before. Uh, I was really intimidated by it. Um, it turns out it's totally not hard. Uh, I had heard that people referred to FPC as origami circuits, so I figured, well, why not paper prototype this? I went and got a, a $30 inkjet printer, and I just started printing versions out. And that really allowed me to um, narrow in the like mechanical sizes and sort of mechanical fit, because this thing had to like wrap around a lot of components, and there were a lot of constraints on where things needed to be. And so I did probably 20 versions of these, um, just printing them out, laminating them with packing tape to get them to be the right thickness and stiffness, um, and then just you know continually like assembling and disassembling that part of the phone to get everything to fit. Um, and then once I had a pretty locked in uh, physical shape of the board outline, then I started routing my components into that um, and had just enough room in the end for, for everything to fit. Um, and then it was time to send it off to the, the FBC factory um, and have them make it. Um, there are factories everywhere in Shenzhen. Uh, this is not the FPC factory, but this is what they typically look like, big sort of ugly concrete buildings. Um, <clears throat> but the cool part is that you can get just about anything made and even in small quantity. Um, this is what I got back. This is actually the fourth version, but they all kind of look like this. This is still in panels. Um, <clears throat> uh, so if you're not familiar with FPC, um, it's very similar to you know, a rigid, normal rigid board, but instead of having FR4 fiberglass in the middle, uh, it has um, like a capped on tape type plastic, right, high heat plastic, it's the same, same type of plastic and capped on tape. Um, so this is what they start with. So this is going to the factory, I got them to, to let me film. Um, this is what they start with, it's a, a piece of that plastic with uh, copper on either side. Um, they first take that and they do it in stacks of like 10, uh, put it in a drilling machine and drill all the holes. Um, so these are typically ganged heads of five uh, next to each other, uh, and then in front are all the different size drill bits. Uh, the thing can automatically switch drill bit sizes. Um, next it goes into a uh, copper etch bath to etch the via holes to connect uh, traces on one side of the board with the other side of the board. Um, this room is super smelly. Uh, it's super sort of toxic and um, hard to breathe in there. Uh, Next it goes into the etch. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to take video inside the room where they exposed the design onto the copper um, to do the sort of resist mask for the, for the acid etching. Um, but these are the machines that do the acid etching and it actually, I don't know if I can see where it comes up, there's a window here. That window in the back is where they, they expose them and this, this conveyor belt machine actually runs between the two rooms. They feed it in on one side where it's controlled lighting and comes out this side. Um, and this is a mixture of there's some FPC in here and then that's rigid there. Um, <clears throat> next they put on the solder mask. Uh, for rigid, solder mask is like a, a liquid, but for, for FPC, it's actually just capped on tape and they stamp it out uh, on, a, on a stamping mill with a, a steel die and then they literally just stick it on by hand with like a sticker. Um, uh, 
Uh, next, it goes into silkscreen. This is just like silkscreening t-shirts. Uh, it's totally manual. They just align it uh, by hand. Um, silkscreen it and put it on drying racks. Oops. Um, ah! I got an alert that I was supposed to back up my machine, and now I have uh, Um, and then lastly, they do uh, electrical tests on it, make sure that everything should that should connect does and that things that shouldn't connect don't. Um, these are like bed of nails test jigs that are custom to each board uh, that have little pogo pins that, that touch all of the pads. Um, and they make a new one for every board design. Uh, so these were just to the ones that they were like using frequently uh, they had like rooms and rooms filled with these. Um, uh, lots and lots of sort of tools made for each board, like three to four tools per board. Um, so this is what I got back, uh, and uh, I needed to solder it myself, uh, or I did solder myself. I did not uh, use a solder stencil, which I totally would next time, um, but it actually turned out it's fairly doable with just like a syringe and then pushing the solder paste around with your tweezers. Um, I didn't have too much trouble. This is actually my first time doing surface mount, um, and I kind of dove into the deep end. Um, these are 0.6 millimeter BGAs uh, and 0402s. Uh, it turned out not to be too bad with the microscope. Um, just you know, just use a hot air rework gun. Um, there is kind of a magic to FPC, which is that you can expect BGAs from the other side because it's clear, which is kind of cool. Um, this is soldering down the headphone adapter uh, just with 30 odd Kynar. Um, this kind of got more gnarly and like was harder to repeat. I didn't have that much problem with the actual like surface mount parts, but I had a lot of problems with all of this stuff of like using 30 odd Kynar to do random wire hookups and like weird sandwiching of things. Um, this is what it looked like in the end. I ended up having to add a lot of capped on tape and UV curable solder mask to deal with shorting issues uh, because the thing that comes down on the top of that, you can see it in the corner, is the screen and there's like this steel backing plate on the screen and that was shorting everything out on the board, um, which took me a while to figure out. Uh, so while all of this is happening, I'm sort of having to work through how am I gonna modify the case and like all of the mechanical side of this. So I started out by going uh, into one of the back alleys behind the markets uh, and buying used iPhone backs uh, as sort of uh, cannon fodder for, for the Dremel and then later the CNC mill. Um, you can buy these in stacks of 10. Uh, they're like two bucks a piece um, in sort of various uh, quality. Um, so this gave me a lot of chances to sort of get the mechanical side of things right. Uh, I started with just a hand Dremel, um, just making a super rough hole. I basically carved out all of the material in that corner I thought I could get away with and then kept going. Um, uh, and what I ended up with was super rough, but it sort of allowed me to, to push things around and figure out, okay, like how is this gonna work? Uh, but I wasn't really very satisfied with how that looked. Uh, so my friend Nick, uh, he's a mechanical engineer in Shenzhen. He had just bought uh, a decent uh, desktop CNC mill. And he's done a lot of um, mechanical work that has required CNC milling, um, but had never really run a CNC mill himself. So um, we spent a lot of time uh, just trying to figure out how to, how to work with the machine, how to work with Mach 3 and that kind of thing. Um, uh, but just if you're curious, this whole setup that we're looking at here, including the PC and the pirated copy of Mach 3, uh, is about a grand uh, US in the markets. Um, we thought, how hard could it be to drill a hole? Um, thought maybe it would take an evening. Uh, it ended up taking us a number of, of late nights uh, and a couple uh, which, which turned into a couple all-nighters um, to get this right. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things we learned is that fixtures are just super key when CNC milling. Um, we ended up using blocks of uh, nylon that I bought on Taobao um, just to make our own fixtures to, to really clamp this thing to prevent vibration and to enable repeatability so that we could run multiple backs through the exact same process and, and sort of dial in. Because the tolerances that I wanted uh, to sort of get everything to fit were of the like, 0.1 millimeter range, which is like the thickness of paper. Um, and, and so, you know, particularly my vertical tolerances were kind of in that range. Um, this is the fixture we made for the uh, headphone jacks. This is a iPhone 5 headphone jack. Uh, and Nick designed this cool little uh, jig. Uh, and then we wanted to mill off the uh, front of the jack so that it fit nicely in the hole that we had. Um, 
This is actually a failed run where we managed to mill off one of the contacts as well, which is uh, kind of frustrating. But we were able to dial that in pretty well. Uh, the tolerances of this setup ended up, for the mill, ended up being like sub 0.1 millimeter, uh, which is really awesome. It allowed us to get that wall really thin and nice. Um, and then it was time to put it together. Uh, this, this was a really frustrating part of the project. Uh, I thought this whole project would take me a month, and by this point I was like three and a half months in, three, three months in, um, and I was having problems with vertical space, and so there were things pressing on the back of the LCD, which was causing this crazy banding, and, and I was ruining uh, LCDs just left and right. Um, and so I had to figure out like how do, how do I just remove more material to get that vertical spacing. Um, and again, we're talking about like fractions of a millimeter here. So I started like removing material. This is the shield that goes on the back of the display. Um, and so I started just carving that off. I just basically took the Dremel to everything I could. Um, this is me under the microscope um, drilling off the top of the 30 aug kynar. Uh, I don't think you're supposed to do this, um, but it did work. Uh, <laughs> Um, there must be a better way to solder these boards down to the FPC, but I haven't found it. Uh, and in the end, like, that part of the project was kind of anticlimactic because, like, eventually I just removed enough stuff and I stopped breaking screens. Uh, and, and the result was um, a working phone. Uh, I have, I have uh, I'll do a little brief demo here. Uh, I don't know if you can hear this, but... Um, that's a working headphone jack. And so the question is like, what now? Where do we go from here? Um, I've learned a lot in this project, um, and I thought I would just pass on a few of my sort of takeaways and you know, where I think uh, as a community of hackers, uh, people could go with this, and some, some takeaways that I'd like you to take on. Um, or at least internalize. Uh, so the first is that this, this scheme of switching lightning uh, is not applicable just for headphone adapters. Like you could do this with anything that plugs into the lightning jack. Uh, and so this, this scheme could be, for instance, uh, usable to put like a micro SD card uh, on an iPhone. Um, software support is a different story, but like, yeah, using these USB switching chips, they're cheap, they're easy to work with, like this scheme will work. Um, this, this design is open source, it's on GitHub. Um, but more broadly, I think there's this unnatural fear of phones. Uh, they're really just small computers, and I don't understand why we're not modifying them in the same way that people are like modding desktop computers. Uh, you, you can run them entirely outside of a case, um, this is an iPhone success that literally has just a battery, a logic board, and a screen, and that's really all you need. I'm starting it up with tweezers here instead of the button. Like, you just short two pins and it starts up. Um, and you don't even really need the battery. You can get the connectors that plug into the proprietary battery connector um, in the markets, at least. Uh, so um, I definitely would encourage people to not be afraid of this stuff. Like, it's, yes, it's small. Yes, it's a little bit fragile, but it's not that bad. Um, and then the last thing is, like, if you haven't done FPC before, if you haven't done flexible circuit boards, they're really not that hard. Um, they're not, there's not anything magic to doing them. You can make paper prototypes. The design really isn't any different than making rigid boards. Like if you can make a rigid board, you can make a, a FPC. They're a bit more expensive. I was paying like 75 bucks a run for samples, um, uh, which I guess doesn't sound that expensive for what people pay for boards here. It's a little bit expensive in China. Um, and then the last thing is come to Shenzhen. Uh, it's amazing, it's like visiting the future. It's this crazy Blade Runner future. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> if you'd like to hear more about my adventures or uh, you'd like to watch my videos, um, these are ways uh, you can get in touch with me. Um, and feel free to find me afterwards. Uh, I have the phone with me. I have um, sample PCBs uh, in various states of assembly, uh, and I have some stickers. So uh, thank you very much.